Hey, I'm here with uh, Maryland State Senator Cheryl Kagan. Uh, we were just in a panel about uh, election uh, reform. What's been going on in Maryland in specific? Because every state seems to have headaches. Maryland has a lot of headaches and a lot of things that we do well. Uh, we helped expand voting rights for felons who have served their time, and I think that's good for democracy. But in Baltimore and elsewhere, there were some problems with them actually trying to cast a ballot. Technology is always a big issue. Do we have the best voting machines? Are our voter lists accurate? And do the ballots get counted accurately and in a way that the public has confidence? And then this year, a third issue that came up a lot was that voters were energized about coming out in the primaries, Democratic and Republicans, either for or against any particular candidate. And they discovered that Maryland has closed primaries, which I frankly support, but how do we make it easier to change parties so that they can participate at a time when they're paying attention and can switch their party if they choose to? Since you're electing in your primary the best person for the general election, wouldn't you want to see who does better among independents, which sometimes, oftentimes are the critical deciding factor in a general? Well, I do believe that independents should get more rights to vote. Uh, we have a challenge, actually, and it's something I've looked into legislatively, in that they can currently only vote for Board of Education. I think they should be able to vote for any nonpartisan offices, including judges, uh, and we don't allow them to do that yet. I mean, in the uh, I mean, in the uh, primaries. Do you Understood. Understood. Yeah. I. I uh, I'm not sure whether I think we ought to open up for independence. The Republican Party tried doing that a bunch of years ago and they found that virtually no one took advantage of it. I can tell you that as a candidate, it's hard when we don't know who's going to be voting, it's hard to know who to reach out to in order to educate them. When I know that I'm talking to Democrats who vote in primary elections, those are the doors I'm going to knock on, those are the people I'm going to phone bank, those are the people I'm going to spend hard-earned campaign dollars trying to reach out to communicate with. If the whole world could come out and vote personally in my primary, I don't know how to reach them, which means that misinformation or popularity contest may end up sort of having the most impact, and I don't think that's good for democracy. I think um, a, lot of, a lot of proponents of it say 40% of the overall electorate is actually independents, so it's a huge swath to lock out, but I'll move on. Um, you saw uh, in Arizona, in New York, in California, in all these states, obviously having nothing to do with you, um, five-hour voting lines, New York where I live, you had to switch registration six months before. I wasn't paying attention in October, most people aren't. What is the movement forward? Because I, you see people across the globe saying, you guys look like a third world country. In Maryland, when you update your, voter, your uh, driver's license or any other DMV interaction, you are told, okay, you are currently registered as, and would you like to change that? Mm -hmm. And so people do have the opportunity to reflect on that and make the change very easily. Um, it's not six months, but it is pretty far in advance in Maryland as well. We've got to respect that there's a challenge with keeping our voter lists updated and yet also doing it as close as possible uh, to Election Day when voters are more likely to be paying attention. Is there a will on the state level uh, across, across lines to make, make voting uh, smoother or are you seeing resistance among your Republican friends who, frankly, uh, it seems many in many states have, have not favored that. Right. Well, Maryland is a dark blue state. We have an overwhelming Democratic majority in both the House and the Senate, but we do have a Republican governor. And so there is a desire and a need to work together across the lines to try to enact legislation that makes sense. Um, we had the felon voting rights uh, vetoed by the governor, but we overrode it quite easily. Uh, we've got to make sure that we can enact legislation that our governor will sign. In my personal congressional district, we had an open seat. Our fabulous congressman, Chris Van Hollen, win the nomination to be our next U.S. Senator. Independent money came in, and even though it was from progressive organizations, it was still independent, unaccountable, anonymous dollars. So that's a problem. In the race to succeed him, I think we had nine candidates. Two of them came in with personal wealth. And it ended up being, although there were a number of very talented candidates, the top three included those two people who had their own cash. And I was pleased to see that the one without the personal wealth 
uh, one and one handily. I actually, I think I saw that story on the Young Turks. Uh, who was that? Who Jamie won? Jamie Raskin. Yeah. Jamie Raskin is my Senate colleague, is brilliant, is a constitutional lawyer and scholar, and is going to be a tremendous member of Congress. But he was up against people spending millions of their own dollars, and it became the most expensive congressional race in history. It's funny because I interviewed someone from a very libertarian persuasion this morning who basically his message to young people who are now inspired to run is find a, a venture capitalist to fund you, find, find that one person who will fund you. It seems like this might be a message that the message actually could beat the money. So I was a Hillary supporter and have always been a Hillary supporter, but the appeal of Bernie Sanders' $27 message was exciting. We should be running uh, candidates and campaigns at the grassroots and reflecting the support that we have at the grassroots. When I first ran, there was a $4,000 cap and I, I put my own personal $1,000 cap. My very first campaign, I had a $50,000 budget, and I didn't think that anyone should be buying more than 2% of my campaign. And so that was voluntary. But I think we need to continue to have grassroots campaigns whenever possible. Yes, it's legal to spend your own money or to have, it, uh, to have independent expenditures, but money, it would be nice if money reflected grassroots support and uh, and democracy at its finest. Let me ask you a question because you said you had supported Hillary, not, not specifically about her, but in general. There's this real um, kind of like don't insult my intelligence uh, mentality now. You have like people like Barney Frank come out and say it doesn't it doesn't affect us. Obviously, Secretary Clinton has said it doesn't affect her. Uh, uh, the, uh, the populist re revolt on the on the right and the left say, give me a break. It doesn't affect us. Uh, how how are people who are supported Bernie or Donald Trump or whomever uh, supposed to believe that? Not just about Hillary Clinton, but just in general, this this belief that you're going to be at a you're going to give a speech at a rally or whatever. I'm taking on Wall Street. I'm taking on big oil. But then you have fundraisers with them. Right. right. I think I'll speak for myself. Mm -hmm. In my very first campaign, so just for your knowledge, um, I served eight years in the House, and then I chose to not seek re-election, and I had what I call my 12-year gap year, and now I'm in the Senate. Rehab. That's, that's right, exactly. Uh, it's pretty unusual. In my very first race for the House, I had a 10-way race, two incumbents, and then eight of us going for the third seat, and I know this is a longer lead-in. At a debate once, I was asked, we were all asked on a panel whether we would allow lobbyists to buy us lunch. And I said, sir, they all looked at each other. Everyone looked at each other. I don't want to answer that question. I don't want to, you know, you go. No, you go. And I said, I'll go. I said, sir, if you think so little of me that you think that my vote can be bought for the price of a hamburger, please don't vote for me. Please vote for one of my opponents because you need to be able to trust my morals, my ethics, my values, and what I stand for. And if you don't, then I shouldn't be representing you. Got it. I hope lobbyists are buying better than a hamburger these days. Well, Maryland's laws are, are okay. really strict. They actually now cannot buy me a hamburger. Okay. Uh, last question is a good segue. I'm asking everybody, what, where did that uh, pit in the belly come to get you passionate about politics? What's your story, how you, how you broke into it? There are a lot of different stories, but I will tell you that first semester freshman year, I learned that my commitment to equality and peace and justice, and uh, which I thought made me a moderate, it turns out it made me a liberal. And I walked in off the street onto Ted Kennedy's presidential campaign, his national headquarters, and by the end of that summer, I was on the floor of the Democratic Convention for Senator Kennedy's sail against the wind speech. This was his primary against uh, President Carter. Against Jamie Carter. And, uh, and I was completely hooked and have been involved in politics and policy ever since. Uh, the liberal lion, they, they call them. Uh, great. Thanks for taking the time. I appreciate it. Yeah.